Hey guys, today is part three of my positive breach birth series. So we started out with breach without borders. Then we heard from Allison on her beautiful breach birth in Hawaii. And today I'm speaking with Georgia Machu in the United Kingdom. And she is a mom of two and had a beautiful breach birth in the United Kingdom but she had to do a lot of research and advocacy. She went all the way to 42 weeks and had a hands-off, undisturbed approach to her vaginal breech birth. I cannot wait for you to hear this positive breech story and how breech is just another term for normal birth. Thanks for listening today. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Okay, before we get started, I have a couple of reminders. The first, if you are pregnant and you are seeking more information, I have a ton of free guides for you at birthstory.com. Click on the tab, the workbook. All you have to do is put your email address in and you have access to my whole library. These are all of the documents that I share with my private doula clients. So if you're interested in learning more about delayed cord clamping, cord blood banking, placenta encapsulation, what the epidural procedure is like, download all my free guides at birthstory.com. While you're there, I would love for you to pick up a copy of the Birth Story Pregnancy Guidebook. It's a 42-week, week-by-week guide to your pregnancy. It is a 42-week guide to your pregnancy, week-by-week. It has 42 journaling prompts, lots of birth affirmations, 42 birth stories, and it tells you everything that's going on inside of you from your baby's perspective, you can get $5 off and free shipping and a free gift by using code birth story podcast when you check out. Last but not least, if you are a fan of this podcast, then I just ask that you push pause and leave me a five star review. I don't know how all the algorithms work, but I know that the reviews help other parents find their way to my podcast. I appreciate you. I appreciate you listening, and I would really appreciate a review. Thanks, and enjoy this episode. Hi, Georgia. Welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for reaching out. We're in the middle of our Breach Without Borders series. And so Georgia is coming to us from the United Kingdom. And we're very excited to hear about your experiences with Breach Birthing. And so before we get started, Georgia, could you share with our audience a little bit about who you are, aside from where you live in the UK? but who you are, what you do, how old your kids are, all the things and how our audience could get in touch with you if they are just really moved by your story and want to reach out. Okay, of course. Yeah. So I'm Georgia. As Heidi said, I'm based in the UK, just outside London in a commuter town called Bishop Stortford. 
I grew up, I'm the youngest of three girls, and I grew up with a mum who had three very traumatic birth experiences. So naturally, I was very fearful. In fact, I was petrified of birth. I've always wanted a family of my own. But, you know, having doing labour, childbirth was just a block for me. I just never knew how I would be able to get through it. And when I was pregnant with my first, I thought, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? And one morning I just couldn't sleep and I found myself on the internet, ended up down a rabbit hole and was Googling hypnobirthing and I stumbled upon it. And I signed up there and then and was like, wow, I have to do this. And I remember doing the course and by the end, it had removed all of my fear. And I thought, oh my goodness, I felt so empowered. I don't care how I labor now. I just do not care because I'm going into it fearless. It had removed all that fear that had hung around me that I'd grown up with following my mum's experiences. I birthed my boy, which I can share a little bit later. Um, and then naturally, when I, um, I just went back to work, which was in London at the time. So I was working in the city on the rat run, as we call it. And then I had my second. And again, I thought, well, do you know what? I know what I'm doing. You know, I'll use hypnobirthing again. He had other plans. So his birth was a little bit more challenging, which is why I'm here today to share that with you all. But after his birth experience, which I have to say was so overwhelmingly positive, I just thought I have to share this with other women. So I stopped my job in London and I decided to become a birth educator, predominantly a hypnobirthing instructor. And so I work with women now, teaching them the tools and techniques to support them and their birth partners. So it's very much a couple approach, you know, not just the women, but birth couples or women and and their chosen birth partners just to support them through birth and their pregnancy and aside from that I also am a breach birth mentor which means that I support women who are presenting breach and I'm supporting them to explore their options and I am supporting them should they choose a vaginal breach birth and even if they don't um, choose that, then I'm there to support them just so that they can make informed, educated choices, which I believe is not something that is kind of widely supported at the moment. My children, I've got two sons aged six and three, and they keep me very busy aside from this. But I'm very proud of what I do, and they are as well, and they love to come and meet my couples. <laughs> and say you've got a baby in your tummy (laughs) and I'm trying to kind of get rid of them so I can get on with the class but no I'm I really love what I do and I'm so so passionate about empowering couples with the knowledge that I have. I am so so proud of you also Georgia. I mean it's such a beautiful chosen profession. I think it's a calling too. Like you said with your mom some things got planted in your genetics of how we birth, right? And you had this opportunity and this calling to change the narrative of your DNA, right? So that future birthing generations, those eggs are inside of us, inside of our mothers, inside of our grandmothers, you know, and we have the opportunity to, we feel that birth even before we're here because we're part of it and we have the opportunity to change it and you are part of that change. What an amazing journey. So where do we find you on like Instagram or your website? Yeah, Yeah, so I am am on Instagram. I hang on that out on there quite a bit. So you can find me at Birth Easy with Georgia, all one word. Yeah, so Birth Easy with Georgia, you can find me on Instagram. I also have Facebook, but I tend to hang out on Instagram because I just love the visual side of it. It's a very It's a much more visual and creative platform, particularly for births, I find, you know, when you can share these wonderful birth videos, stories, images. I kind of quite like to post quite raw images sometimes, also the very cute ones, but let's keep it real. That's kind of my approach. So yeah, you can find me there. And then also I have a website, which is www.birtheasywithgeorgia.co.uk. So you can find me there too. I'm always happy to kind of chat to women over social media platforms. So if anyone wants to reach out, share their story, or if they themselves are presenting breach, or if they just want to chat, rank, cry, or say, I'm here for you, whatever you need. I just love to support women. 
Mm -hmm. I love the term breach birth mentor. I'm not even sure that's something that we have in my own community here, but as we're opening the conversation more and more about positive breach birth experiences and the Breach Without Borders organization, then I think there's such a growth opportunity that's happening worldwide to support mothers. So let's turn a little bit and talk about your pregnancy journey with your six-year-old and how, you know, you had mentioned that you had taken this hypnobirthing class and you went into that experience without fear. And I really want my audience to hear that again and again and again, because just this morning, very early this morning, I was texting with one of my doula clients. Her name is Abby. And Abby was sharing about her traumatic first birth. She had intended to birth at a birth center and ended up with a premature leak of her water for many, many days. And it turned into a uterine infection and she was only in prodromal labor. So then it ended up as a hospital transfer and it ended up as a cesarean section because of this uterine infection. It was very traumatic for Mm -hmm. her. And just this morning, she says to me, what tools do you think I need for this VBAC? And I said, you need hypnobirthing. So I'm going to go on with the story. Just one more thing. Her husband's a pastor. And so she says to me, I'm not sure he'll be on board with that. And I said, oh, I'm so glad that you said that because there's a misconception worldwide that hypnobirthing means someone's hypnotizing you. And that's not it at all. So Georgia, let's start there. Let's talk to me about that journey, that pregnancy journey in this hypnobirthing class and what hypnobirthing means to you. You're right. There is that preconception and it is worldwide. And I think, you know, pregnant women, when they're in, uh, tend to be a little bit more open-minded when They're going through the experience because they're thinking, oh, do you know what, what tools can I explore? What options do I have? And they're becoming, as they go, as their pregnancy progresses, they become a bit more open-minded. But I do find sometimes it's their their partner who's a little bit like, what is this? And it does have that preconception of being a bit what we call woo-woo and a little bit out there. And I have had fathers walk into my classes, like literally say, are we going to be chanting in a circle? or where are the incense sticks? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, you've come to the wrong place if you think that's going to be here. You know, right. you didn't pre-order your sage before your hypnobirthing class. <laughs> no, that's it. But it's just that it, that's it. It comes with so many kind of preconceptions and there's stigmas. But the, you know, I dive straight in in my sessions and as I did with mine myself, and it's very theory based, very scientific based at the start, which seems to kind of grip them. And, and that's when I, oh, wow, yeah, this, this really is something. For me, when I did the course, I'm very fortunate. My partner's really quite open minded. Anyway, so he was fully on board. And we went to these classes, and the program that I did was the Wise Hippo program. And there are teachers globally for this program. And it's a great program and it fully endorses the birth partner's role. And so we explored the theory of birth, the physiological kind of aspect, how we are designed to give birth, how we know where it's all primal. And then you're given the tools and techniques, so the breathing, the relaxation. And then you look at the more practical aspects. Okay, so what do you want from your birth plan? What can you do to physically prepare your body for birth? Or in your massage and, you know, your pelvic floor and those aspects and then finally we look at the birth partner's role how can the birth partner support you and I always say you know how can you go in as a dream team that's what we want so when I finished that course by the end I was like this is amazing it had removed the fear the fear was gone and I remember thinking to myself I don't care how I birth I am fearless and that to me was was what I needed But of course, birth workers will know that, you know, having that mindset puts you at such an advantage anyway. Positive people attract positive stories. Negative people will seek the negative evidence, will will attract the negative stories, the negative drama. So 
your practice drives your preparation. Um, so it's really good to kind of be in that strong mindset from, from there. But it, it isn't just the classes. And I always emphasize this to, to all my, you know, my clients that I can only get you so far. And then it's up to up to the couple then to practice what they have learned and really, really it is you work hard at it. And then, and I did. I took a nice long maternity leave with my first of around six weeks. A wise mum said to me, you will never get me time ever again, <laughs> or at least not for a long time. So take that time to, you know, get your nails done, do a bit of self-care, go on a spa day and what have you. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I did. And it was the best time because then I was able to practice my my relaxation, my breathing, and really get my head into into the zone. I am um, so glad you mentioned this, Georgia, because you are you have birthed in the United Kingdom, and I am interviewing you from the United States. And our systems, our medical systems, are very different. Right. And so I also took my mat leave at thirty four weeks gestation, and that's because I worked for a UK based company, AstraZeneca. Right. So I was able to do that. OK, now a lot of our listeners are in the United States and don't have that opportunity. We encourage you if there is a unique way. So I've had I have had many doula clients get medical reasons like anxiety so that anxiety builds up. That's a natural thing that sort of can come. So I encourage listeners to look at your body, look at your needs and talk to your healthcare provider about what opportunities there might be for short-term disability. There is short-term disability with many employers that's different than taking a maternity leave early. So if your employer doesn't start your maternity leave until the day you give birth, which as we know could be several days after you begin your labor process, I really have encouraged my doula clients to look into short-term disability and taking a few weeks off at the front end. So thank you for bringing that up, Georgia. That leads me to my next question, though, about your birth and your birthing in the UK. I have two clients this year that have transferred. They were with Google and Wells Fargo. And so they were based in the UK and they transferred to Charlotte, North Carolina and hired me as their doula for their second and third births. Now in the UK, For their first births, they had a doula that was paid for by the system. They had midwifery care at a birth center that was attached to the hospital. That's very different than where I practice. And so I was wondering if you would share that you've taken this hypnobirthing class. And my question is, is that paid for by the government or is that private? It's something that, yeah, we chose to invest in in ourselves. And I always encourage new parents to actually invest in themselves this is their well-being and it contributes to your mental health postnatally and also to your baby you know you're invested in your family already so yeah it is it is a private um, investment okay yeah. and then did you have the option did you get an opportunity to say hmm, i wonder if i will be birthing at home or the birth center or a hospital so i did have the option um, Lex, my eldest, was presented breach um, at 34 weeks. And so I, at that stage, it's very much like, oh, you, you can't birth at home with a breech baby. It's not something that we, the, and so in, in, uh, in the UK, we have something called the National Health Service, the NHS. It's wonderful. So we're, we're really fortunate where there is a medical emergency or a medical need, we have the provisions of the NHS, the National Health Service, to support us and help us. So in this instance, yeah, they said we are not comfortable to obviously um, provide a midwife out to your home birth should you be breach. And so I explored my options and was advised to consider acupuncture. And so at that stage, it was 34 weeks, and I went to see an acupuncturist who provided something called moxibustion. Now, if for those who may not be familiar with acupuncture, maybe even you are, surprisingly, even I didn't know this, but moxibustion, it doesn't involve needles. 
So I assume that all acupuncture involves needles, but really it's just about you know engaging with those channels in ch- that we, that Chinese medicine knows so well. And what moxibustion is, is it's these what they call mugwort sticks. And I would say they look a little bit like um, chalk. I don't know if you guys, yeah, like white chalk sticks. And um, it looks a little bit like white chalk sticks, but they're black. It's a bit like charcoal sticks, if you like. And you burn them and they release a heat. And what you do is you burn them right near your little toe on each foot, alternately. And your little toe is connected to a channel up by your uterus and the cervix and as you burn that stick it heats up that channel and it creates a movement in your baby and I successfully turned Lex my eldest using moxibustion at around 34 35 weeks pregnant but the interestingly the success rate is good but it has to be within the window which is why I'm so passionate as, as well about kind of mentoring for each presentation, because what is available, the options available to you at, say, 37 weeks are different to 34 weeks. So it's about trying to, um, you know, to go down the right avenues at the right time in your later pregnancy, presenting for each. I love so much that you are mentoring women through this. You are doulaing them through their breach <laughs> presentations. And I would love, I have a guide on my website, birthstory.com. There's a section on birthstory.com called the workbook. And this is where I write all different free guides. There's like 75 different guides on there, but one of them is on flipping a breech baby. And we talk about moxibustion and lots of different other tips and tricks and tools. And I would love to share it with you and to get your feedback because I'm always open to tweaking it, adding to it. Um, But I would love for it to also be a resource for your women that you mentor. I think that would be wonderful. Absolutely, definitely. So on just, so many of my clients have to do like step one, two, three, four, five before their babies will, you know, make that turn or that descent. But with Lex, just the moxibustion and the acupuncture. Did you do anything else or was that the primary function for helping Lex to turn? I believe that was the primary function because I I actually felt the movement. So I kind of knew when that happened and obviously was elated because that then meant that I could have the birth that I had been longing for. That was the primary function. However, when we get to talk about my second that's a little bit more eventful, let's say. Yeah. What was the birth that you were longing for? So Lex turns, then he what? He turns, and so he was head down, and it was, um, it was, uh, I was elated. I had been longing for, obviously, using my hypnobirthing techniques, a lovely water birth. In what we have is the midwife-led unit of the hospital. In the UK, you have your hospital and the options available to you. You have a consultant-led unit on the hospital, which is a bit more of a clinical environment. So this is for people who are high risk um, or have medical attention or need, you know, require medical attention or have medical needs. Or sometimes some women just choose to be on that, on that walk because it's doctor-led. And so it's a bit more kind of clinical, if you like. And then you have what's called the midwife-led unit. And this is a separate unit, a separate ward, although even describing it as that, it's a much more nurturing environment. In there, you often find you've got more birth pools. Some have surround sound, mood lighting, and like lots of affirmations on the walls. And it's led by the midwives because there is research, as you may know, that low-tech midwifery care leads to better outcomes. They try to kind of channel that so that women who are seeking that much more um, low-tech, more natural approach to birth can get that, yet in the safety of the environment within the, you know, the NHS service and um, within the, the, the trust. So should there be a medical emergency, it's not far to just be, you know, whisked off down, down the corridor and into the consultant-led unit. We also have birthing centres, which are standalone birthing centres, which are almost like a home from home environment where you have a team of midwives. Again, nurturing, very holistic approach. 
but they're just standalone. And then, of course, there's the option for home births. And home births are supported by our NHS. So a midwife will come out from the hospital. Once you have the signs of onset labour, then you would call the midwife and, and hopefully someone is available on call to come out and support you at home to labour your baby. So they're the options. And so my chosen option was to be in the midwife led unit at the hospital because as well, my mum hemorrhaged with all three of us. So that's why it was so traumatic. And who's to say that wouldn't happen to me? So I had to kind of err on the side of caution. I thought, right, this is kind of the middle ground here where I was in the right place. Should there be a medical emergency? Yet I could still seek that, that more natural approach to birth that I wanted. What gestation were you when you went into labor? When I went into labor 40 plus one, late at night. Right on yeah. time though. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 40 plus one. So it was a Saturday evening. And then I woke, I kind of, I was so, ex- this is the thing. I was so excited I couldn't sleep. Isn't that an amazing emotion mm-hmm. to be excited rather than fearful, anxious? And so that, you know, that obviously rides with the endorphins and the oxytocin, which if you don't know, endorphins and oxytocin are your pregnancy hormones that really help you birth your baby. Oxytocin, you know, brings on your surges and helps your labor progress. And endorphins are your feel-good hormones, which you get when you exercise. And you can also, if you stimulate endorphins during labor, then it really helps to support your body through the process. Oh, it's so beautiful. So what did you do through the night? Yes, I was so excited I couldn't sleep. So I decided to stimulate my endorphins and watch lots of um, comedy and bounce on my ball. I did try to rest. I listened to my birth tracks and my scripts to just relax because the idea is if you can't sleep, just rest because your body's going to need it. And then when my husband woke the next morning, he said, I think something's happening. So we called the hospital and it's about... It's 35 to 40 minutes away. And we went up and they said they did a vaginal examination. So basically they put their fingers up to see how dilated and how progressed you are. This is something that you can choose to say no to. This is, you know, you, you're within our, your rights to say no. I don't know how it is in America, but um, yeah, we, it's probably a controversial topic perhaps as it is here. But No, um, it's in here in the United States. We informed consent is a big thing and you can't have informed consent without informed refusal. So they share with you why they would like to perform a vaginal exam and then the risks and benefits like we could break your water on accident during this exam. It could feel crampy. It could make you bleed. So our providers that I witness, maybe because I'm a doula, try to provide informed education. And then each individual can make the decision to consent to that exam or to refuse it. Um, So I have often many clients who receive no vaginal exams at all through their whole pregnancy, labor, or delivery. And then others that will have every four or six hours of, you know, a check-in and they're fine with that. I find a lot has to do with your history. My clients that have a history of sexual abuse or trauma typically will decline those exams. And then others who are kind of type A personality and like to know that they're making progress with what they're doing, which is so funny, like a number progress on a chart because there's so many things that mean progression. I see a hyper focus in the United States on the dilation. And I'm like, wait, wait, we find out so many things. We find out the position of the baby in a vaginal exam. We find out the station of the baby. We find out the effacement, how thin the cervix is. There are so many more things you learn than just the dilation. So it's great that you guys are so much, you're, you know, hot on, you know, informed consent. We do have this here, but I think so many mothers go into birth in the UK without realizing that they have a choice. So when um, a a medical professional says, oh, um, um, you know, perhaps we should do a vaginal examination they almost take that as I have to do a vaginal examination as opposed to oh I have a choice here and then they're exploring okay so why are you doing it what do you suggest are there any alternatives and that sort of thing at that point I had a vaginal examination and they said you know what you're you're not too far along 
you would be you would benefit from going home you know and just resting at home and progressing a bit more so I did I drove back home and now at this stage so many people um might feel disheartened and think oh no you know I I got all excited but I just tried to remain in the zone and remain focused and thought well it's happening just keep going you know keep going with the endorphins the oxytocin the scripts the relaxation the breathing have go home have a bath and eat some food and and come back and I was only home for four hours before I I then went into a bit more established labor if you like yeah one of my favorite charts that explains the stages of labor comes from Bradley Birthing. And I think if you Google it, you could find it. And it's the overview of the stages of labor from Bradley Birth. But they do such a beautiful job describing prodromal labor, early first stage, late labor, hard labor, transition, and then the second and third stages of labor. And I have all of my doula clients, Georgia, print this chart out and laminate it and put it on their refrigerator. And when I was birthing, I remember saying to my husband, I'm ready to go to the hospital. And he was like, well, the fact that you can say that out loud with words and articulate that so easily means I think we're in early first stage. <laughs> like not really. Yeah. So I wanted to say, I think it's a, it's, it's a really good because it's hard when you're a first time mom or mom to really understand where we're at in that process. If you don't have a doula also by your side to, or a midwife at home to kind of guide that for you, it is, it's very hard to know what early first stage is like compared to hard labor when you've never experienced that. So often here in the United States, this is, we have a thing called triage. I don't know yeah. if that's that. So you, it's like a stopping point. You go to triage and then they often will send you back home to labor some more. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because as well, I think as a first time mom, not only is it all, also one, there's so much unknown and you're like, is this it? Isn't it? How far gone am I? But sometimes if you have quite a journey to get to the hospital, you've got that in your mind, you know, what time of day is it? Is it, is it the rush hour? Is there going to be traffic? And you want to make sure that you get to hospital in, t- in time and don't get caught out. And you've got all this, you know, whirling around in your head and you just want to kind of um, be in the right place or the best place possible to birth a baby. So, no, but that's amazing. I'm going to check that out, the Bradley Birthing, the stage of birth. I'll, I'll have a look at that. Thank you for sharing that with me. So you had a gift and your gift was that you got to go back home so yes. that you could release more of these amazing hormones with the oxytocin and the endorphins and just be at home in your peaceful private, safe, undisturbed. These are words from Dr. Sarah Buckley in her gentle birth and gentle mothering. And so in our home, we're private, we're safe, we're undisturbed, and we get tap in more to our mammalian selves. Whoa, amazing story, right? I was just jumping in to interrupt really quick with a couple of reminders. Again, you can pick up all my free guides at birthstory.com. You can get $5 off the Birth Story book by using Birth Story Podcast. When you check out, that also gives you free shipping and a free gift. If you are loving this episode, I say you start at the beginning. Start on episode one and go on a journey with me, letting me be your virtual doula and guiding you through this pregnancy. And if you are loving the podcast, I ask that you share it and leave a five-star review on whatever podcast player you are using. Today, I celebrate you. So now let's get back to this episode. So it only took, it's no surprise to me that you were only home for four more hours. So then you have to travel 45 minutes again. Yes. Yeah. So then we were up the motorway again. And then when I got there, they were like, right, okay, this is it. You're in established labor. And my waters broke quite epically, like you see in the movies, which is what is everything that I try and tell my clients. It's not because, you know, we are so blindsided by the portrayals of birth in the media 
and how actually, you know, your waters can actually break quite gently over, you know, quite some time. But no, my mind did break quite dramatically. And then I chose at that point to get into the water. And there I stayed for the next six hours, labouring my my baby. In terms of people in the room, I have my husband and then I have one midwife. And when I was there, she said, we have a student midwife here. And how do you feel about her being in the room? And some people do opt for minimal people in the room, which I completely respect. And I thought maybe I might be of that thinking, but I thought, you know what? No, I'll have another person. It's like two for the price of one. So I had a student midwife in the room too, which was lovely. And they were both really on board with the sort of birth environment that I was hoping to achieve. So I I played my affirmations from the Wise Point program and I played, you know, and I just listened to my music and I actually had them out loud. There was a docking station for the, so it was completely in in the room out loud. Um, And I was still kind of conversing in between my surges. And then I got this urge to push. And now the intensity of the surges, yes, they definitely cramped up a notch once my waters broke and I got in the water. And I was just breathing through them. And yes, did they hurt? Yes, they did. (laughs) But I always thought that it might kind of rank up a notch. And as I breathed through them and I listened to my tracks and I remember I kept watching the clock because I wanted, I was thinking, oh no, my mum and dad are going to go to work and I wanted them to come and meet the baby. (laughs) So I was kind of clock watching when really I should have been a bit more focused. But still, it got to midnight and I got got an urge to push and I couldn't fight it. It was involuntary. And the midwife was saying, I don't think you're ready to push it. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm going with it. My body is telling me to push. I think I kind of pushed with a a few surges before, you know, he really was ready to come out. And I always say, like, I howled like a beast. You know, the real primal noises. And then he was here. He was born and he came out. I brought him up to my chest. I had a, a beautiful baby and I held him in the water and it was all quite surreal. And I was really fortunate that my husband got to capture a few second moments, like he captured a few moments, you know, just about 10 seconds or so at a time throughout the stages of birth. And at the end, he pieced it all together and made a birth video. It's quite magical because I've got that moment where I'm first holding him in my arms. But um, yeah, I held him and um, he, he was great. And I really remember quite clearly that the student midwife said to me, I have never seen anyone so calm during birth and she just said this hypnobirth and stuff is amazing and that's what I want to do and I thought wow I'm making an impression from my first experience and as well I remember thinking was I that calm because you know you're riding it and the intensity of it but I must have been doing okay. I see as you know I've been a doula for 17 years and I see the difference comes with the fear. Those with fear fight and those without fear surrender. And it's as simple as that. And when we're surrendering, we appear much calmer, much more in control, even though we're, we have no control at all. <laughs> we appear yeah, in control. But I will, you know, when I role play with my moms, I, I will see them tense up their whole bodies. And I say, when you do this, you're holding, you can feel your abs engage. You can feel your vagina squeezing. But when you get that like primal howl, like you said, that breath, ah, our abs release, our pelvic floor releases, everything can come down and it just feels better, you know, to surrender, to just let go, you know, and there's many things. I think hypnobirthing and I think birth in general, um, when we learn to surrender and we learn to let go, like these are real life lessons, right? So when something happens at work or in your marriage or with your family or a trauma, another trauma, like a loss of a loved one, the tools are there after, you know, Mm -hmm. I believe after you've become a mother, the tools are there. So what I think your midwife said about is a lot of times, especially in a more medicalized wires and technology environment and the fear creeps in, they call it transition for a reason because it's the death of the maiden right? It's like the death of who I was. And when you feel the baby getting lower and lower and everything opening, 
we were talking about hormones earlier, Georgia, so many of my clients will say, I felt the surge of the fight or flight hormones, like the get me out of here. I want this over. And that's the surrender, right? Mm -hmm. That is the, your body is literally like that maiden is dying. (laughs) And your body is like, wait, no, I want to hold on to that. And then it's the surrender. So that new mother, that mother being birthed or the new mother being birthed, if you're on a multiple baby experience, that letting go and that surrender, you know? And yeah. it's, I think when the, those of us that are, have the gift of from others to be able to witness the birth, you know, that's what we see, the fight or the surrender. Yeah, and absolutely. But you have to have the tools, Georgia, and you had the tools. So <laughs> hypnobirthing is a big tool. Exactly, it is. And that's, you're, you're right. I, I have learned skills for life and even my husband now will ask me to put on a track if he can't sleep or something random. But I even, when toddlers having chant, you know, tantrums and I'm using my breathing techniques to get through it, but you're right. You're just learning to surrender to your body and, and it's kind of like putting your mind, I always say it's like putting your mind on a shelf, letting your body and baby just do what it has to do. And it, that's, you know, that's a really positive way to, to get on with it. I think that's beautiful what you said. I'm going to tell my clients now to put their mind on a shelf yeah. and, and then put, and then close that shelf, close the door to the room. The yeah, shelf, because anything the in shelf your mind, is it. I mean, you're, if your mind's overworking, it's not going to help. So you need to just, you know, park it and, and, <laughs> and let it relax because your body and baby, they know exactly what to do. I think it's beautiful. Now tell me, what's your three-year-old's name? His name's Sonny. Sunny, Sunny and Lex. I love it. So tell me about Sunny because Sunny is this breach birth journey Mm -hmm. that we were going to share about. And so tell us a little bit, were you planning the same sort of experience, water birth, same midwives, that journey? Absolutely. So of course, naturally I've had this, you know, nine pound four baby in the water yeah, he's quite, you know, wow. he's definitely on the large side, no pain relief, no intervention. I hypnobirthed him out and was had a really positive experience. So naturally, second time around, I was like, yeah, do you know what? I've got this. And I'll just do a little top up of hypnobirthing and it all will be good. Lo and behold, 34 weeks, my baby's presenting breach. And I was like, oh, do you know what? Not again, but we've been here. Again, I've got this. I know what I'm doing. So I did my moxibustion and I also turned to spinning babies, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So I know it's quite big in the US. And spinning babies, if, you're, if you don't know, is an incredible resource to help you turn any babies that are presenting kind of breach or transverse. And you can turn them using certain kind of positions, if you like, like inversions and certain, almost similar like to yoga positions. Um, there's some inversions that you can do. So in essence, I was lying on an, up, an ironing board upside down three times a day for 20 minutes, yeah. um, making myself rather dizzy and unwell whilst I was doing it. And no, no success. I, I even tried hypnotherapy. I tried old wives tales, which is sticking raw ginger, you know, to my little toes, all this crazy stuff. And so nothing worked. And so when I got to 37 weeks, In the UK, the NHS will offer you something called an ECV, an external cephalic version. And this is where they try to turn, your adductor will try to turn the baby by a manipulation of the hands on your tummy, on your abdomen. They will try to turn your baby into the optimal or more favourable position, which is head down. I use my hypnobirthing tools and techniques for this because... It's not a pleasant process. It's not a comfortable process. It, but I wouldn't say it was painful, but I definitely wanted my uterus to relax so that those muscles were relaxed in the process, which gave baby more room. So I listened to my tracks and I did my breathing and, and he went head down and he just pinged straight back up. And then he went back head down and again, he pinged straight back up. So three times he did that. And she said, I'm really sorry, this has not been successful. And an ECV at 37 weeks, statistics are 50-50. There's a 50% chance of baby turning. 
in my case, he did not. So at that stage, I was taken into a hospital, into a, a room, a hospital room with a doctor and presented with three options. I remember this very clearly. So the first option was to have another ECV, which was unlikely to be successful given that baby's growing at such a rapid rate and getting bigger and bigger. So another ECV, which is unlikely to be successful, a vaginal breech birth or a C-section, an elected C-section. And then I was told the safest was an elected C-section. And that was what was strongly advised. And at that point, I said, OK, show me the data. Good and for you. That stage, you see them kind of fumble with the papers. They're not ready to, you know, to have a mum who's like, all right, bring it on. Show me what you got. <laughs> Show me the statistics, show me the data. Why is it that a C-section is so much safer than a vaginal breech birth? What parameter are you using to define the word safe? Safety emotionally, safety physically, safety with healing and recovery, safety with future births. What if you wanted to be a mom of eight, mm. right? So yeah. there is a lot of decisions that, it's, that go in. Did they want you to make a decision right then or did they want, Oh, they did. Okay. So yeah, they pretty much did. And I said, okay, thank you for sharing your, your information, your data. I'd like to choose a vaginal breech birth. And they wouldn't accept that answer. So So they presented it as if it was a choice, but it really wasn't a choice. Well, that's, you know what? I think maybe then I would appreciate the United States because they don't even give it to you as a choice. So I think I rather have them been more honest. Um, Mm -hmm. that's so interesting that they gave it as a choice, but then it wasn't really actually a choice. We're working with advocacy here for it to be a real choice. So what did did they do? I know it's so interesting. So at this stage, I should say, you know, not all NHS trusts are like this. So there's a bit of a postcode lottery when it comes to breach, breach births, because some NHS trusts really focus on upskilling their midwifery and their, you know, maternity care. And some just aren't quite there yet. Um, And I guess mine was at the latter at that stage. And I think particularly I was sitting in a room with a a doctor as opposed to a midwife who are a bit more holistic and nurturing and take you as an individual. But she actually, it was a female doctor. She said, um, so I said vagina breech birth. And she said, okay, well, let's just schedule in a C-section anyway. And I said, okay, fine. I will pluck a, I said I will pluck a date out of thin air, but I won't be coming and I would rather you give it to someone, another mother who has a genuine medical emergency. So yes, we kind of plucked this date out of thin air and I was allowed to leave that uh, that consultation. I would have picked a date. I would have picked 43 weeks gestation. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you nearly went to that. Let's get there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I don't think they would let me leave, to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, that date came and went, and I called them. I said, "I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not coming. I feel well. I'm good, and I'm going to hang on." And then in the meantime, I was reaching out to the hospital um, to someone called a consultant midwife, and their role is to kind of liaise with you and the birth plan that you are hoping to achieve and liaise with the hospital and the provisions and how they can support you within the parameters of their procedures, protocols and safety and so on. And she was great, actually. After lots of toing and froing, she eventually kind of was on side with the sort of birth that I was hoping to achieve. And she said, we don't have many midwives who are skilled in delivering breech babies. And in the meantime, after this appointment where I had decided to do a vaginal breech birth, not only was I reaching out to the hospital trying to seek their support, but I was doing endless research on studies and literature about breech births, why they are considered dangerous or not, let's say, and just, you know, where where the limits lie. And it just gave me so much confidence with, you know what, no, I am going to do this. So what I learned was that Breach presentation is just another version of normal. There have been studies in the past which have led us to believe that it's dangerous. And there have been studies in the past, such as the breach term trial in 2000, which was in Canada. It was trialed in 26 countries. 
And what they did was they looked at women presenting breach and they looked at those who had a vaginal breach delivery and those that had a C-section and looked at the outcomes. And they concluded that the C-section was a safer outcome than a vaginal breach birth. But what they didn't look at was how she was delivering vaginally. So that the women were on their backs having instrumental deliveries. So it wasn't really a fair trial. Now, at the time, medical practices changed overnight. I don't know whether this is globally, but I know that within the UK, the what we call um, you know, the guidelines, the NICE guidelines for the UK, which kind of guides the medical procedures and protocols, they changed overnight, which meant that you know, any woman presenting breach was then you know, advised strongly to have a C-section. And so going back to practices before then has been a real uphill struggle because in the you know, subsequent years, they found that that trial to be flawed. It was challenged, well, not flawed, but it was challenged or the, you know, the findings and the conclusions to be more, more substance. And, um, and they, yeah, and it's just, it, it's just been an uphill struggle since then. And so there has almost been a wave, they say, of midwives who aren't really skilled in delivering breach because they haven't been learning that kind of skill, if you like, because it's, it, it's not required because it's breach, right, straight away C-section. But gradually, NHS trusts in the UK are dripping it back in, but it is it's a bit of a postcode lottery. And this is exactly what Dr. Rick Safries and Dr. David Hayes from Breach Without Borders were discussing a couple of episodes ago. And that is the fact that it's not that it's unsafe. It's that the proper studies haven't been conducted in large amounts and unskilled workers. And that's where I find in my own community, too, is I know many amazing midwives and OBs that would be very wanting to help a mom have the type of birth that she desired, including a vaginal breach birth, but there's the skills are not there. So mm-hmm. Breach Without Borders is traveling all around the world teaching midwives, students, and obstetricians how to deliver, and EMTs actually, how to deliver a baby breach vaginally. With all different presentations, right? So we know we can have footling breach and Frank breach. And so what presentation was your son? Yes, he was Frank breach, which is, the way I understand it was, it's a bit more of a favorable position, if you like, of the the breaches. So yeah, he was Frank breach and he came out bottom first in the world. And so, yes, yeah. I also there, I, I was very strongly led by the, findings and writings of Jane Ford and Mary Cronk. And they were pioneering kind of midwives who did a lot of research in breach. And their theory was hands off the breach. So they strongly emphasised that a breach baby can birth itself and that there is no requirement for instrumental delivery or intervention. And that, yeah, breach is just another version of normal. I read a lot about, you know, the risks and how a breech baby births and how, you know, kind of the the twisting of the shoulders and the head entrapment and that sort of thing. So I was fully engaged and and very very fully conscious um, and focused during my labour, especially at the pushing stage as to how my son came out when I delivered him vaginal breech. So Um, let's go, let's go back a little bit. Sure. So there you are and you have said, I'm going to have a breech birth, and I am not going to this cesarean section. How was your partner? Supportive? Um, Yeah, that's a good question, because obviously it's my body, but it's also his baby. (laughs) And he was very supportive, and he he said, trust your instincts, let them guide you, and, and, you know, I'm with you, whatever you decide to do, which was really, really great to have someone beside me like that supporting me fully on side. So he was great. And then, so you were with this consultant then. So your husband's on board and really believing in you and supporting Mm -hmm. this decision. You've missed your cesarean section 
And yes. you're with this hospital midwifery consultant. What a beautiful job. I'm like, I'm, I'm available if anyone would like to hire me and send <laughs> me to the UK for this job. I mean, what an amazing yeah. Yeah. consulting job to talk about the birth plan that you want. And then the, how was this decided? I mean, I was very close to changing trusts and birthing at a different hospital a lot further away in order to get the support and the you know, provision that I wanted. And in the end, eventually the consultant midwife was on site and said, do you know what? We can support you. It's all good. And so, uh, you know, this was about and that's when I was doing my research. So this was over probably a two or three week window. So I'd had my 37 week ECB, that horrible consultation where I was given my choices, but not given a choice. And then I went away and was like, I'm doing my research, reached out to the consultant midwife, had a few kind of communications backwards and forwards. And then it was like, brilliant. Yep, we're good to go. I'm then approaching 40 weeks pregnant, knowing that I can have the vaginal breach birth that I wanted. So with a vaginal breach, I was advised that that, um, to not have a water birth, which I was really gutted about, that I, um, I would be on the consultant led unit as opposed to the, you know, the more nurturing midwife led unit where I would like to be. And I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, it was like a compromise, you know, you're giving me the birth I wanted. I'll be there. That's no problem. Um, Were you also like, I'll just come when I'm pushing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm such like a, a breaker of the Push rules back. in this system. Yeah. I'm like, great. That sounds wonderful. I'll see you when I'm like, have already pushed five times. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is where Sonny Chops had, I call him Sonny Chops, or my, my breach bruiser. He had other plans because I then got to like 40 weeks and then 41 weeks and there's no sign of baby. And at this point, an induction isn't really advised. An indu- a typical or normal induction is not advised with a breach birth. It's a straightaway C-section, basically. And the hospital's calling me. Are you okay? Are you sure you don't want to come in for a C-section? You know, so that in the end, I turned away three C-sections and I was like, no, I'm holding on. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's hard. It's hard to push back at this stage when, you know, you know, your baby is in a less favorable position in their eyes and you're fighting for the care. You finally get it and then he's not turning up. And it's like, am I doing the right thing? You start to question your actions, but there was something in me. First of all, I've watched a TED talk, actually, that said you are the expert of your own body. You know the data and you are the expert. You are the only one who truly knows your body inside out. And I was quite confident that they'd got the the due date wrong and quite wrong, actually, 10 days out. So when, when he was late, I wasn't surprised. But then it gets to two weeks and I'm thinking, oh, crumbs. I thought, right, do you know what? I will go in for daily monitoring. I don't want to sit in section, but I'll... At 42 um, weeks. At 42 weeks. Okay. It was 42 weeks. And I thought, I'll go in for daily monitoring and I'll just kind of to and fro from the hospital, still pushing back in the C-section. And then just as I was packing my bag, I started to get these twinges as I was saying goodnight to my son, my, t- my son who was a toddler at the time. And I thought, no, this can't be it. And you know when you're just like in denial because it's something that you've wanted to happen for so long and then it finally, you know, presents itself. You're like, nah. And my husband's then like kind of looking at his watch and, you know, secretly timing them and he's saying, Georgia, I think we need to go. To-. And I'm like, no, we don't need to go anywhere. I said, it's just stalling. I'm sure of it. I'm just, it's nothing. And then he's like, that's it. I'm, he, he took control and he called the hospital and they're like, right, come in. So I got into, um, I got to hospital and they were all ready for me. And there I was met with a midwife and a doctor. And they said, so we've got a midwife here who's experienced in delivering breech babies. And she was, she was a, a more mature midwife who'd obviously had a lot of experience, probably pre this Hannah et al trial. They said to me, we deliver breech babies um, with you on, your, on the bed on your back with your legs and stirrups. And no. I said, no, you, no. <laughs> I said, no, you, no, you don't. I said, not, not in this. I said, I'm afraid that's not going to happen. And they were just like, oh, I said, I'm, I'm delivering this baby upright, forward and open. I said, I've read Mary Cronk, you know, Jane Ford, you know, the Christian prayer position is a much more favorable position to deliver a breech baby. And that's what I'll be doing. 
theory is hands off the breach. And that's, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you could support me with that. And I'm reeling off all these studies and all these pioneering midwives during my labor. But you're in labor. I know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're amazing, Georgia. Amazing advocacy. Oh, gosh. Well, I just I think I was a thorn in their backside, but I am just very determined, I think, um, to have this. But it paid off. But I should I should say that I did go into hospital at that stage with a plan, a birth plan A, birth plan B, birth plan C. A was, should I get to hospital and he be head down, take me straight back down to that midwife led unit and get me in a, you know, a birthing pool. B was if he was still breached, then, you know, I had my breach plan. And C, should it end in a C-section, I wanted a gentle C-section. And so I went in there knowing that whatever happened, I was having a birth that I wanted no matter what scenario. And, and I think that's a really empowered way to go in. I'm informed, I'm educated, I'm prepared. And no matter what happens, it's, it's in control. It's on my terms. And I think that's a really huge mindset. It makes a difference going in feeling like that. But lo and behold, I, um, I just, yeah, I breathed and used my hypnobirthing techniques. I swayed from side to side and I just was humming through the surges. and then. All of a sudden, I got this urge to push. And the midwife was like, have you got an urge? She obviously saw it. She just was like, have you got an urge to push? And I said, yes. And then all of a sudden, all these doctors, all these midwives and all these pediatricians, I had an audience of people. um, Had you approved that? No, I hadn't. (laughs) But I didn't mind But uh, they were there and I actually said, look, if you're all going to be in the room, stand back, hands off the breach. And then I kind of hit transition. I don't know if I can do it. And then they were like, you're doing it. And I pushed and he came out bottom first and then down flopped a leg. And then, you know, and then another leg and arm and then his arm. And then I remember feeling just the head. And and I think one of them must have said, that's it, it's the head now. And I gave it everything I, I had because I knew, you know, that was the risk with the, the head entrapment. And he flew out and the midwife was under me, ready to catch. And I was, I was squatting with my head against my husband's chest, squatting on the edge of the bed. And he was sitting on the bed. I had my head against his chest, squatting against him. And then obviously they could all see my bum and this baby coming out of my vagina. He shot out. The midwife was under me, ready to catch him. He flew past her. Thankfully, she'd placed a cushion on the floor just in case. And he landed on the cushion on the floor. And my husband's like, he literally bungee jumped out of your vagina. And that says it all because Sonny is quite a force to be reckoned with. Um, And you had said the whole time, hands off, hands off. So they couldn't even catch him. I love it. So you, so you yeah. made that happen too. You and you and Sunny were working as a team there. Exactly. Hands we really off the were. breach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he and he's out actually his cord snapped. Um, so there was quite a bit of blood around the room, and so he was taken over to the peds, pediatricians um, on their table. They quickly kind of fumbled, and then he was brought to me on my chest. And funnily enough. The fact that his cord snapped, in hindsight, I remember thinking, Lex, when my first was born and I had him on my chest, I remember feeling quite a tugging and I think the cord was quite short. And so I had opted for delayed cord clamping, but I asked them to cut it because it was, um, it was quite uncomfortable. And so I think they must have both had short cords and I, obviously there's no evidence, but I do wonder if that was contributing to their breach positions. I mean, I would say absolutely yes. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's lots of things we see, right? Like um, a lot of times we see breach with the heart-shaped uterus, uterus yeah. if there's like a little septum too. Short cords, tangled cords, right? Mm-hmm. Like if the cord is wrapped around their neck twice and they're breech and they're trying to turn and there's not cord left, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so yeah, it could yeah. be a very long cord, but it could be, but it could be a very long cord, but, you know, wrapped all over their body and such. So. Mm-hmm. We'll never know, right? We will never know. But you had a beautiful, undisturbed, hands-off, breach birth with a ton of advocacy, Georgia. Mm. I'm so proud of you. 
Oh, thank you. It was. And I remember holding him on my chest and I thought, oh, my goodness, this could have so gone a different way. And I just, I felt invincible. (laughs) I really did. And then that was the moment where I was like, I have to share this with other women. I have to educate and inform other women of their their choices, their, their rights in the birthing room. And, you know, these tools and techniques which have helped me labor, labor these two boys. Sonny wasn't quite so big. He was 8'3", but still a decent size. And then what was really lovely was that afterwards, he was so well, I was so well, that they transferred us straight down to the midwife-led unit. So it was almost like in reverse. So we got to be in this lovely, holistic, nurturing room. And then just a few hours later, we went home. And the next day I did the nursery, the, you know, the nursery run with my, my eldest. I felt so good. <laughs> and I really believe that it was just the empowerment, you know, from it all. Yeah, of trusting your body and listening mm-hmm. to your body. I love that TED Talk. Maybe if you can send it to me, we could link to it in the show notes yes. too. So. Yeah. Well, Georgia, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for Allison who shared her birth story before you on her breach birth in Hawaii. I'm so thankful for Breach Without Borders for taking us on this journey of positive breach birthing in this series that I'm doing. And before I let you go today to finish your beautiful afternoon in the UK, can you share with my audience what you feel like was the most helpful product for you for your pregnancy or for your new motherhood? Yeah, sure. There's something that it's called, I call it the big human sausage. It's this huge cushion that's round, shaped like a sausage, and it's called a BB hug me pillow. As you'll know, if you're pregnant or if you're in the later stages or if you've been pregnant before, it can be really tricky to sleep and also to create that maximum, you know, optimal position in terms of, you know, some people suffer with pelvic girdle pain. And, you know, you need to sleep in a position with cushions between your legs and it can get all really faffy, can't it? And cushion under the bump and all this. This BB Hug Me Pillow, it's created by, I believe, three um, kind of chiropractors, physios. Like these are mums, but also practitioners who have collaborated and created this huge bean bag. And it's like a human sausage. It's big. And you sleep with it and it just kind of moulds in your body and it just really really helps you sleep and I actually used it afterwards as well I tied it into a kind of a bagel shape you can tie the two ends together and I used it to kind of prop Sunny in afterwards like while we were bathing Lex for example and stuff so it's something that you know it's that can stay with you pregnancy and and labor and then postnatal as well I love it I wonder if we can get it everywhere but I will link to it in the show notes or something similar too so on Instagram at Birth Easy with Georgia, if everyone really enjoyed this, do you mentor people all over the world if yes. my audience yes. is open to that? Okay, so if you are presenting with a breech baby and you need support and mentorship and education, then I really recommend that you reach out to Georgia, no matter where you are at in the world for some mentorship and support. So Georgia, thank you so much for being here today and for being part of this series. It was simply magical. Oh no, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you for all you are doing with the Breach Without Orders because the more that we can talk about this and the more that we can kind of break down these stigmas and these boundaries that, you know, are associated with breach births and just empower women to kind of trust their body and their instincts. So thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the